Good morning. Welcome. Would you like to take your seats for a moment? We gather together to worship and we're glad to meet in this place and at this time. And we are thankful for the opportunity and the freedom to worship that we have in this land. We're thankful for those that have cared for this place and for this land, and particularly for the Boonwurrung and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge our indebtedness to them and we acknowledge our respect for their elders, past, present and emerging. And we continue to commit ourselves to a better future for our first people and to doing our part to be a part of that as we recognise that they have never ceded sovereignty of this land. Let's hear some words from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high, I cannot attain it. Where will I go from your spirit or where will I flee from your presence? If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. We're going to worship God as we sing a hymn which reminds us of God's faithfulness, of God's knowledge of us day by day, Lord, for the years.
Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God of truth and light, we worship you. We praise you, O God, source of life, wisdom and grace. We come before you in reverent awe. Your loving power gave birth to all that is good. You entrusted humanity with the care of this amazing planet, surrounded us with spectacular beauty, incredible detail and vital interconnectedness. God of all generations, as the author of the psalm acknowledged, your creative presence comes to us in such an intimate and personal way. We affirm your presence with us in an even more wonderful and personal way than that known to the psalmist in the relationship that we can have with you through Jesus Christ and through the work of your spirit. We praise and thank you, O oh God, for reaching out to us and touching our lives in this way. We turn towards you in gratitude, seeking to love as we have been loved. And pray that our time of worship may be a worthy offering of praise and thanksgiving to you for all the ways in which you have led and guided our lives. O oh God, you know us inside and out, through and through. You search us out and lay your hand upon us. You know what we're going to say even before we say it. We come before you aware of our own sins and our own failures. Forgive us, O oh God. Forgive our complicity in the sins of this world in which we live our failure to care appropriately for our environment, our failure to treat all people with respect and dignity, our failure to work for lasting peace throughout the world, our neglect of those who are suffering and dying for lack of basic necessities of life in the midst of our abundance of things, our failure to seek to ensure the well-being of other people, rather than our own well-being. Forgive us, O oh God. We pray that you would cleanse, renew, and transform us by the work of your Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Paul reminds us in a verse that's very familiar to us that if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation, that everything old has passed away and that the new has come. And indeed, that all of this comes from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. We rejoice for the fact that we are known and loved and accepted and forgiven by God. Amen. We're going to continue our worship by singing together a hymn that reminds us of that importance of our longing for God and our hearts being drawn to God as the deer pants for the waters.
we're going to hear our scripture reading for today and Theo is going to bring that to us. Thank you. Today's reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading from chapter 8, reading from page 196 of the Good News Bible. Life in the Spirit. So then, my friends, we have an obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children, and by the Spirit's power we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits, to declare that we are God's children. Since we are his children, we will possess the blessings he keeps for his people, and we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we also share his glory, the future glory. I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be re revealed to us. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. The creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain like the pain of childbirth, but it is not just creation alone which groans. We, who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts, also groan within ourselves. As we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. For it is by hope that we were saved, but if we see what we hope for, then it is not really hope. For who hopes for something he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. The Good News Bible started that passage by talking about us having an obligation. In lots of other versions, we are called, talked about in the sense of indebtedness, that we have this indebtedness to God, that we have this sense of indebtedness in life. And indebtedness is a part of life. Children remain indebted to their parents for life and health, if nothing else, but hopefully for so much more. And students remain indebted to great teachers that have influenced them over the years for patiently enabling them to grasp new concepts or master new skills. Patients remain indebted to doctors who listened to their lecturers and who committed information to memory and mastered medical procedures. So indebtedness marks our lives at various points and it provokes gratitude and perseverance and it can be a catalyst for change. As Christians, we're indebted to God, to the God who gives us life, to the God who draws us to God's self, to the God who welcomes us as family members, as God's own children. We're members of a royal family, the family of the King of Kings. God adopts us into God's family 
and even bestows on us an inheritance. We're heirs together of God's goodness, of God's grace, of God's gifts. But we live in an age where independence is really highly valued and living with a sense of indebtedness is often frowned upon. Some feel that this emphasises God as a domineering entity if we are feeling a sense of indebtedness to God. But it seems to me that it just recognises God for who God is. The present passage explains that the condition of permanent indebtedness to God shouldn't diminish us as people, rather it should be an enhancement of our full human dignity as God interacts with us. We're indebted to one who treats us like family, one we may address as father, Abba, the warmest term of endearment that was used in that world, conveys love and care and connection and intimacy. It's quite stunning that throughout these early Christian communities, even in these early days, like when Paul was writing this letter to Romans, that God had become known to these people through their experience of Jesus Christ as one they could know with this intimacy and tenderness in a personal and very familial way, regardless of whether they came from the Jewish race or not. Family ties are often those that are closest to us, aren't they? And they're ones that come to the fore often at crisis times in our lives. Within families, we share a common life. We are involved in some mutual interdependence in families. And we recognise that we have responsibilities and we also have privileges as part of family life. God, through God's spirit, treats us like family and actually invites us into this bigger family of God. We're indebted to God for the depth of love which we constantly experience through God. Next week, we're going to look at the final part of this chapter of Romans 8. We looked at the first part last week, the middle part today, and then final part next week. And in next week's section, we read something more about this wonderful love of God, a passage that's quite familiar to us where Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's spirit comes alongside us, reassuring us that we belong to God and that we are recipients of the love of God. This passage also reminds us that we are indebted to God for the grace that we experience day by day. Last week, we thought quite a bit of that process of God dealing with the disturbance in our world and the disturbance in our life with the power of evil in the world and of God's grace and goodness and forgiveness towards us. As God's children, holiness is a natural expectation. And yet in this passage, Paul again goes back and reminds us that there are styles of behaviour that can be like weeds that grow up unchecked and have the capacity to take over a whole garden and choke all the beautiful flowers but that there is a way of weeding them out and of uprooting them. This isn't feasible to those that have separated themselves from God, but it is feasible to those who are relying on God's spirit to enable them to respond to God and to make those right choices, to enable them to resist and to overcome those things that are harmful. People of God are called to move beyond using the standards of this world as a guide for how we behave. And we're called as followers of Jesus to a whole new way of life, a way of life that shows to the world something more of what God is like. Now we have an obligation to the new world we live in and to God to live as God's children. Our relationship with God has changed from one of rebellion to one of obedience and our status changes from enemies of God to children of God as we respond to God. And the evidence of all of this we can see by that opportunity to be able to call God Father. The Holy Spirit leads us in life, leads us into the presence of God, just like the Israelites were led during their time in the wilderness. And the Spirit can enable 
us to come out of a sense of almost slavery and bondage to things that we don't want to be a part of our lives into the freedom that God gives to us as God's children. The people of the church in Rome were being reminded of the fact that they've been made in the image of God and that they've been remade in the image of Christ as they've responded to him. Tom Wright expressed it in this way. He said, the story of grace is one in which humans find themselves by losing themselves, endlessly indebted to God whose true self-expression was found in the self-giving love of the Son. Being indebted to grace is like the permanent indebtedness that exists between those who've given themselves freely to one another in a lifelong human love. It involves a state of wonder and gratitude in which our humanness is enhanced rather than diminished, ennobled rather than belittled. We're permanently indebted not only to the love of God, but to the grace of God, the grace of God that flows freely to us. And this God deserves our gratitude and our obedience. This passage that we looked at today, which has so many components to it, and we could look at all sorts of aspects, also reminds us of our debt to the hope that God gives us, our indebtedness to God for the hope we experience. Though we are already children of God, yet there's still a form in which we recognise we don't function in a world that's completely responsive to God. And God's Spirit works to reassure us that though we are loved and accepted by God here and now, God will continue with us even in unexpected and challenging times ahead. For these Roman Christians, there was much persecution ahead and quite horrifying persecution ahead. And they were reassured in this passage that this God would give them hope even in the times of difficulty. We know that our world in general has not come to a point of honouring God as, as ruler over this world. And as followers of God, we live in this strange landscape where we seek to honour God and we live in a world that's in a degree of turmoil still. Yet we have hope in the midst of this, hope built from our Christian experience right from its outset. Paul is stressing that one can't expect to live in this present Christian life and not, not experience times of difficulty and suffering, not experience times when you have to just strain to keep moving forward, to be a part of what is somewhat unseen. C.K. Barrett commented on this saying, the attitude of hope that we have that Christians put no confidence in themselves, but look steadily beyond themselves to find fulfillment of their own selves in the actions of God. And Tom Wright again was reflecting in a similar vein, saying the Christian in the present time is but a pale shadow of his or her future self. The Christian in this present time is a pale shadow of his or her future self. We're called to a life of hope and a life of growth. And so we groan in anticipation of our future full adoption along this Christian journey in an understanding that much of what God has given to us and much of what God is doing is somewhat invisible. So the appropriate stance for us is to patiently wait. Paul is concerned to stress this to his audience, to stress to them that while salvation is something they're experiencing here and now, there's also a future component to it. And they may indeed have to focus on that, particularly in times when they're feeling the stress and strain of difficulty and persecution. Paul reminds us that we're indebted to God for the love that we experience in being welcomed into his family as precious children and of heirs of his promises. He reinforces that along this journey of life, we will constantly be indebted to God's grace to realign our lives and to enable us to walk in a whole new way, empowered and transformed by the Spirit of God. And then finally, he reminds us that he grounds these promises in the reality that there will be trouble and trial and difficulty in life. 
but we can be indebted to God for the hope that God gives us, that God can be with us in the midst of even the darkest of times. So this passage gives us a strong reminder of the indebtedness we have to God and acts as a catalyst for good things in us. It acts to bring gratitude out from us, to bring worship out from us to God. It acts to encourage us to persevere in times of challenge. It acts to enable us to see that we need to constantly grow and change as followers of Christ. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing together the hymn, Have Faith in God, My Heart, which helps us to further reflect on the work of God that God has done in us and the work of God that he will continue to do in us. Amen. We are thankful for those who have been a part of our broader church community and have forged new pathways forward. It's one of those things we can be grateful for as being part of this big family of God. And so next Sunday, we have the opportunity in the afternoon to gather together to hear from Tony Ronaldo. And you may have seen there's some of these flyers around. There's a few outside too, if you would like to take any to put up anywhere that you have access to where people might be interested in this. Tony worked in Niger and in various other places and in the process of that discovered this intriguing uh, new development in how to reforest areas that have been decimated by logging. And the process involved, to my knowledge, the, the planting of trees within tree trunks and therefore regeneration took place on a very much stronger and broader scale than it had previously. His work's been acknowledged as he won the Christian Book of the Year Award in 2022. And now he is involved in lots of dialogue with the UN and the EU to try to see this program expanded throughout the world in areas that have been decimated. We're very fortunate that he's coming here to talk to us. His mother-in-law happens to be a member of the congregation at Rosebud, and they thought this would be a good venue for him to come to, to promote his book, which is called The Forest Underground. And on this day, they're going to also launch the audiobook version of that. My understanding is that Tim Costello is going to lead this session. He has a, Tony has a strong association with World Vision, and Tim, of course, has that background there also. So we'd encourage you both to support this event and also to talk to other people that you may know who would like to come along in the afternoon. We've committed ourselves to providing just some very simple afternoon tea. And I know Sue Lyons was going to be part of that process. If you're able to help her out with that on the day, I'm sure she'd like to hear from you too. 
Just to also remind you or let you know if you weren't here last week that there's also a statement out on the table which was put together by a number of the ministers from the Interchurch Ministers Council in this area. It's a statement in response to the referendum that will be forthcoming and a statement that really affirms the desire that we have that people engage fully with this and be very well informed, particularly by our Indigenous people, so that they can vote on this issue with a well-informed position in their minds. You might like to take a copy of that too, that's out on the table there. I'm not sure that we have many other announcements, Dave, did you? Oh yes, Nancy, of course, and we've got friendship group on uh, Monday afternoon and that will be great. And we're having banjo players, I think, haven't we? Ukulele, Ukulele players, not banjos. Ukulele is, I've got the wrong instrument. It'll be great, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Taze is on this Tuesday afternoon, 4.30. And um, yeah. And David's got something and, well, two Davids. We've got David twice. <laughs> Let's have David Hud while David Price comes forward. Thank you, David. I must admit, uh, this morning I'm a bit confused. You might say that's fairly normal, but. Uh, I have in my diary that yesterday was National Tree Day. Now, as I was coming in this morning with Joy, uh, she disputed that. She says, no, it's next week. And that's why we got Tony Renata. So there we were having a dispute. Now, my whole prayer is based on trees. So either we go without a prayer or, or we go with my diary. <laughs> No, we, can, we thought we'd actually make it a National Tree Week, didn't we? <laughs> but it do, it's a theme, it's a bit unusual, but it does inform the prayers for this morning. Creator God, our gracious and trustworthy Father, today we pause to thank you for your gift of trees. The trees that surround and enrich our lives in Australia trees that we take so much for granted trees acting as the virtual lungs of your creation trying to keep a balance on the toxic co2 that pervades our planet lungs that depend on the magic and microscopic chlorophyll in the green of the leaves forgive us where we have abused neglected and often and overforested your wonderful trees for selfish development and in some countries helped cause drought desert and death by contrast we want to thank you for the humble eucalyptus gum tree and its strength and resilience and aroma that makes us so homesick and for the eruption now in our streets and homes of yellow wattle in abundance to remind us of the imminence of spring and warmer weather. Thank you for the really old trees we know that remind us of your timelessness and reliability and non-judgmental love. Trees that remind us of our grandparents and our best friends over the years. Thank you for the trees in our backyard at home that have character, trees we can talk and listen to, trees we can hug. Thank you for their fun to climb as kids and for the relief from heat in the long dry summer. Thank you for the trees that survive the cycles of bushfire, that though blackened in trunk can always be trusted to emerge again as fresh buds to restore the cycle of life after death and thank you for the wonder of the resurrection in all its forms thank you for the grizzled and tortured shape of trunks that have survived perhaps a hundred years 
whose stories will always be kept as silent as the grave. Thank you for the simplicity and complexity of seeds from which the trees grow, for the mystery of the life and energy of the DNA a seed can produce. Thank you for the courage of a tree to grow toward the sun despite all early life hazards. Thank you for the various arms of a broad tree's friendship, for the embrace for birds as they seek refuge and call for each other. Thank you for the trees whose scars sometimes remind us of the canoes made from their bark by first Australians, perhaps hundreds of years ago. Thank you for trees that creak and groan in the tempest winds and for the way they suffer without complaint. And thank you that Jesus died on a cross made of weathered wood from a tree that will never be named but honoured forever. Thank you for the people in our lives and fellowship that teach us some of the qualities of your trees to whom we aspire and from whom we desire so much inspiration and owe so much gratitude and whose lives are such joy to have around us. We pray as ever for those of our friends who are currently wounded or listless or broken. Bring to them the joy of your salvation. And finally, on this national day, when we honour the trees around us, we pray for all the policy makers and councils who have in their power to make our peninsula and our country a greener and more sustainable place of true growth that cares for the downhearted and the fallen and growth that seeks to be clean and sustainable. May your kingdom come on earth. And we pray it, our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom uh, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The only notice I had, apart from the one that uh, Joy already mentioned, is we've got a fresh supply of Tom Sutherland's cards, the beautiful cards from the Bunyan Tree community in Kerala. People like uh, Claire and uh, Ray and Julie have got them four dollars each and I'll put them out on a table perhaps uh, a couple of weeks time we'll be away next week thank you thanks David it seems appropriate given trees take quite a while to, dry, to grow and be established that we're extending our um, focus to some degree on, on trees over the next week or so. There is actually a, a bookmark we're going to be giving out next week. Um, there's two for each person. This was put together by a group within the Uniting Church who are particularly focusing on ecological issues within the Uniting Church and they've sent them to us with the desire that we take one to keep ourselves and that we take one to give to somebody else to encourage a, a broader appreciation and care for our environment. We at this time in our worship normally acknowledge the gifts that have been brought into the life of our church community and we would like to do that again today. We acknowledge that some of those gifts are shared electronically now and we, we don't see them in physical form and yet they are there. And then others are brought in physical form. So would you like to stand as we bring forward those things that have been brought into the church today and as we remember the gifts that have been given and as we commit them and ourselves to God and to God's service. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the ways in which you have grown your life in us 
and through us by the gift of your spirit. We thank you for the gifts that you have given to us. And we ask you to accept these gifts and the service of our lives as we dedicate ourselves to spread the good news of Jesus through the things we do, through the attitudes we exhibit, and through our actions and through our words. Thank you, O oh God, for your goodness to us in providing for us so wonderfully. And we commit these gifts to your service through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we remain standard, we're going to sing together a hymn which reminds us of both of the fact that we experience God light, God's light and presence with us, and yet we long for a time when we see that more broadly throughout our world. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. And so as we go, let us go recognising that we are held by the love of God which welcomes us into God's family. 
supported by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which enables us to change and encouraged by the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us hope in times of darkness. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on us now and always. Amen.